Bonsoir et bienvenue au CCA. Je suis uh, Kim Förster, directeur associé de la recherche. Um, tonight we have the first um, public of the public events that we organize in connection with the toolkit uh, for today. Um, and I would like to especially uh, welcome our speaker for tonight, Tatjana Schneider, from uh, Sheffield University in the UK. Um, each summer um, here at the CCA, in the framework of our doctoral students program, we invite scholars, practitioners, and thinkers to reveal their tools and to propose concepts and methods in order to elaborate on a specific topic and equally important to make us think um, out of the box. In the framework of this year's toolkit, we discuss activisms. More precisely, we would like to um, interrogate the different forms that an engaged practice can take for scholars and um, architects alike. We ask uh, what motivates research and how can architectural research be mobilized in the service of uh, society? How did or does architecture relate to um, larger societal issues? Um, as in a changing academic landscape, there are obviously limitations to uh, what can be said or, or what not. And uh, yet, um, the more important question remains how to take a position. To discuss concrete cases of what by some might be considered as activist research um, and practice, and to complicate how architecture as well as architectural history and theory relate to society, uh, we have invited five speakers from quite different contexts to present one of their recent projects. Next to Tatiana Schneider, other speakers are Pilin Tan, uh, formerly Martin University in Turkey, Andres Rumfuber, a practicing architect and theorist from Vienna, uh, Thorsten Lange from ETH uh, Zurich, Switzerland, and uh, Charles Davis II from the University at Buffalo uh, in the US, who will speak each of the nights this week. In five public presentations at nighttime, our guests put up for discussion how, through their own work, they analyze and interpret the social production of space, um, attempt to decolonialize architectural education, uh, propose to apply strategies to rethink housing and labor, um, create platforms to implement gender parity, and uh, problematize uh, um, racial politics in architecture history. And during the daytime in seminars and workshops together with the doctoral students in, resident, in residence at the CCA over the summer, they further elaborate then their own approaches and experiences with regard to um, the politics and economies of research, different research methodologies and consequences for their own teaching. Activisms um, yet um, have been a constant concern of the CCA over the past years, most explicit with certain exhibitions, publications, research projects, and public events. And what is more, the CCA understands everything uh, that we do as activists promoting architecture as a public concern. In this sense, exhibitions such as Actions, What You Can Do With a City in 2008 featured common activities such as walking, playing, recycling, and gardening uh, to push against accepted norms of behaviors in cities, sometimes even challenging uh, legal uh, limitations. And the exhibition, The Other Architect, in 2015 then uh, presented alternative, often collaborative practices to develop architecture as a field of energetic, critical, and radical research addressing the urgent issues of our time. Another thematic focus at the CCA um, that takes position is the environmental debate. And uh, while the exhibition, Sorry Out of Gas, in 2007 captured architectural innovation spurred by the 1973 oil crisis, the exhibition, It's All Happening So Fast, in 2016, offered a counter history of um, the modern Canadian environment, challenging basic assumptions about the country's relationship to nature by focusing on environmental disasters since World War II. And the multidisciplinary collaborative research project, Architecture and for the Environment, currently explores these tensions between architectural evidence and historiographic narratives by proposing alternative curricula or by writing heritage petitions. Activisms in terms of research, um, as we argue with this toolkit, thus can take quite complex forms, encompassing different types of social, cultural, and political action and agency, given that the once existing binary structure of establishment versus counterculture, system versus movement, above versus below, power versus subversion is no longer valid. So. 
with recent developments of uh, neoliberalism and an accelerated individualism and consumerism, previous societal achievements, for example, critical theory, diversity politics, uh, or multicultural programs in our post-political and one could add um, post-critical or even post-historical times um, tend to have become compromised if not co-opted or corrupted. So Tatjana Schneider uh, tonight will present on problematizing social engagement. Um, she's a senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield School of Architecture where she researches the social and economic mechanisms of the production of space with projects such as Agency Research Center and Urban Education Life. She's co-founder um, of the Research Center Agency and was a founding member of the Workers' Cooperative GLASS, Glasgow Letters on Architecture and Space which aim to construct both a theoretical and practical critique of the capitalist production and use of the built environment. Among her publications are Spatial Agency, Other Ways of Doing Architecture in 2011 together with Jeremy Till and Nisha Davan, as well as contributions to the anthologies um, Use Matters and Alternative History of Architecture, the Social Reproduction of Architecture and Politics, Values and Action in Contemporary Practice, and the Rutledge Companion to Architecture and Social Engagement. And as an announcement, Pelintan tomorrow will present on decolonializing architecture education. Andreas Rumfuber um, then on Wednesday will present on rethinking public housing. And Thorsten Lange will present on Thursday on implementing gender parity. The program will close with uh, Charles Davis II, uh, who will present on building black utopia. As an organizational note, as you might have noticed, we're filming this event um, and uh, the uh, conversation afterwards to publish them on the CCA website. And after the presentation by Tatiana, we invite everybody to join the discussion. Um, and to kick this off, um, we have asked the participants or some of the participants of the toolkit to prepare some questions. Uh, but there's also time for Q&A. And Lev Bratyshenko, curator of public on the other end of the table, will um, moderate and uh, time keep uh, the conversation. So please join me now in welcoming Tatiana Schneider. start? Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you very much um, for having me here at the CCA. Thank you very much, Kim, for um, the invitation. Um, it's very exciting to be speaking in this context and as part of the series. Now, um, I only arrived on Saturday night and I didn't really trust my brain to function properly uh, already tonight, so um, please forgive me, but I'll stick um, quite a little bit to my script that I've prepared. I um, yeah, didn't want to sit in front of you rumbling incomprehensively. So um, uh, Kim's asked me to talk um, about my own definition of activism and research, as well as the role of research in the wider context of politics, um, the civic society, and the economy. Um, I will not talk much about activism directly, as I'm also deeply skeptical about the usefulness of the term, but um, I think I will circle around those notions of um, activism, social engagement, uh, the concepts, con concepts and issues that um, could be seen as embedded in this field. Um, so what I'll do instead is um, to provide a very quick and very partial and very incomplete glimpse into a project that I'm currently working on before moving on to say a little bit about um, why I do what I do. And I'll then go into a broader discussion of challenges, limitations, maybe even opportunities for spatial practice in the broadest sense that will contextualize, conceptualize, um, yeah, and as it says here in the title, pro problematize the issues around uh, this field of social engagement and activism and practice and research, which of course is also at the core of this week's workshop. So I'll start with this project. It's a, it's a little bit difficult. I don't know where to look also with you all around me. So, <laughs> um, so in 2017, um, a consortium of four partners from four different European countries, very different European countries, Romania, Slovenia, uh, England, and Finland, um, was successful in securing a very large uh, three-year research grant under the European um, Horizon 2020 program, which was called um, 
smart urban futures. It is one of those research grants that are very hard to come by. Uh, it's two-staged with a very small success rate. Um, but the kind of grant that my British institution um, is very keen for us as re researchers to, um, to get and see more of because it's you know, collaborative, it's interdisciplinary, it's uh, seen to be expanding um, the boundaries of, um, of sort of mono um, scholarly um, contributions. Um, the partners, and some are universities, some are NGOs, some are independent research organizations, um, and each locality also has a mix of, of, um, of those partners, have been brought together by um, a team of two people operating out, out of Tampere University in Finland, and I'm uh, leading the English um, group of researchers. In total, there's about 20 people involved. Um, so in the context of seemingly ever more unequal development and increasingly unequal access to facilities and resources, the project aimed um, or aims at investigating what one can do to change this, how it can be done and what universities uh, most crucially can contribute uh, to addressing injustices and inequalities, uh, which have been in the UK at least exacerbated also since the imposition of austerity policies uh, from um, 2010 onwards. So in order to address these inequalities, um, all partners, we all share this uh, view that notion of agency uh, and knowledge have a major role uh, to play. But um, there's also questions about where exactly that knowledge is located, who it is that has agency and why, and who essentially has the power to act on certain forms of knowledge um, and so on. And critical um, of the power that comes with knowledge and the means to reproduce uh, this knowledge, we have become acutely aware of uh, the limitations also of certain models of education that are um, still very internalized, very inward focused, uh, when the world around us uh, seems to be getting ever more complex. So we argue therefore that um, this ever more complex setting around us, which is more and more difficult, you could say, to decipher, needs to be supported by, um, let's say, a different, other, more complex models of education. Uh, one um, model um, that is um, arguably based on a reconfigured relationship between those who have traditionally produced knowledge, so the academe and maybe other institutions, and those who have been seen to be at the receiving end of the benefits of such knowledge, i.e. the communities. So for many in the team then there exists, um, existed this hunch um, that um, this rift between academia, let's say, and communities um, could be overcome by changing the focus of education, that education needs to engage with these contexts more directly in, um, in inverted commas, life in a live manner. So when I say life, I mean a model that works within the messiness of the world as situated in the urban realm rather than a sanitized design studio setting, something that is agile, responsive, and much more connected to the world and leads uh, subsequently also to different spatial outcomes, which are less abstracted, less top-down, less corporate maybe, if you wish. So in turn, such a model, we'd argue, provides those involved in these settings with different tools and sensitivities um, towards their environments so that they themselves can act as appropriate. And of course, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that this was a hunch, but of course it's more than a hunch um, when I say that um, these kind of life models of education also lead to different spatial outcomes. Many of us, uh, not just in Sheffield, but also others in the team, um, had extensive experience in working in such ways in a variety of settings and know what can be achieved. In fact, um, breaking away from the uh, confines of our ivory towers uh, we knew uh, would at least bring a different set of questions uh, to the table when 
uh, one returns from the city. But um, take my institution, um, which is Sheffield University in England, where I've been based for the past 15 years almost. Um, there we have not only developed numerous critical pedagogical approaches and methods that challenge how knowledge is produced and by whom, but uh, and this will become crucial also for the discussion maybe later on, uh, these pedagogical, let's say, experiments have not uh, been taken in a bubble. Around this way of working, we have also fostered um, these themes through an engagement with histories and theories um, uh, of, of such models and frameworks in the widest sense, so much so that the School of Architecture has quite a reputation for its social and political approach to architecture. Um, and one such approach is here in, in the photo. Uh, so if you're a little bit partial to cynicism, which I am, you um, can't help also but notice that this has um, become quite marketized. So um, no, the social and political is something that um, we have as a brand on our website and students uh, who pay quite substantial um, um, fees, um, tuition fees. Um, it's around 20,000, I don't know, I can't translate it into dollars, I leave it. No, it's a lot of money people have to pay to, to study at this most socially and politically engaged school of architecture um, in the UK. So the social and political has become a commodity um, that we sell. Now, back to the European project, which is not quite simple on many levels. Um, the research grant gives us time, as any research project does, and resources to allow us to be more reflective about uh, the teaching, but also maybe the research that we have been doing in this field. So we are using this grant to look more rigorously at the challenges and benefits of life, or call them situated or embedded, collaborations between universities and communities and what you know, those collaborations can bring to the production of space and particularly um, a more, um, towards a more democratic, a more fairer production of space. And to do this, um, the project um, is composed of a series of local investigations. Um, so each partner is working on its own specific geographical, cultural, economic, and political um, and social setting on what models of this situated um, education, uh, so education that takes place in the urban and is about the urban, um, is life, can be. And in the picture, which is very um, yeah, faint, you'll see um, an initial snapshot of an early mapping of examples of the collaborations that have been taking place um, across uh, Sheffield. So beyond the local strands, which are quite independent from one another, we have vertical blocks, of course, that represent common themes of interest, and we all contribute to those transversal aspects. And a lot of this is happening via Skype, um, with 20 partners present once um, a week. And you know, it looks like this here. We um, all know, I guess, what it feels like too. No? So what we've done so far is um, we, uh, we've begun cataloging um, and categorizing practices from across the globe that work at the intersection of those themes that I've mentioned. And currently, what we're doing, we're in the middle of, um, uh, of another work pat package, which is um, about mapping and, and how um, groups um, are mapping the knowledge that they uh, gather. So rather than talking about those transversal aspects, I want to say a little bit more about the particular Sheffield strand of the project before moving on to the other parts of the presentation. So as I said before, the School of Architecture in Sheffield has a very long trajectory of this research into what you might want to call non-hegemonic forms of spatial practice, an interest that precedes um, the more recent, um, certainly in the UK, governmental shift towards community planning and programs around localism. There has been research, including my own work, which Kim has mentioned, around um, notions of participation, agency, um, open source planning, alternate um, practices, um, feminist pedagogies, um, and so on. Um, and um, uh, so we've looked at current teaching practices in this context, but also the content of our teaching. I say a little bit more about this later on. So within an academic context that defines itself more and more uh, through external funded research projects only. Um, this large research project provides um, a breathing space. So um, uh, in order to get research time in our 
what is so nicely called workload allocation um, models. So each academic has a certain set of hours and um, then uh, a certain set of hours are <laughs> allocated to the research that you do, but uh, you only get those hours when you have externally funded projects. Otherwise, um, uh, the time is actually quite diminished. So an externally funded grant gives us time to look at things uh, differently. Um, it also obviously allows us the privilege um, to consolidate the work that we have been doing over the past few years. And we use this time, uh, um, let's say, to connect uh, the dots, connect islands in a way. And what I mean by that is that we use the grant to go back to the project that we have been involved in. Uh, and um, we're talking to people that have been working with us um, uh, in, in architecture. Um, so we've been charting these conversations and the process of analyzing them, which is uh, what this photo here is about and what you saw in one of the previous photos, this more location-y uh, diagram. Um, but it's not only that. Um, we also use the grant, of course, to zoom out, to zoom out of our immediate context and look at our own practices, teaching as well as research within a wider geographical context and within a much broader theoretical discourse. And this broader geographical and theoretical field then concerns specifically the politics we are embedded in. The politics of education, so the curricula we uh, follow um, or have to follow as an RBA accredited school of architecture, uh, the politics of the institution, and institutions more broadly, including, as I mentioned before, our own research environments, and the metrics um, used to measure impact both in writing and doing. So we're increasingly, as academics, uh, measured by the um, uh, impact factor that um, the peer-reviewed journals that we have to contribute to um, um, hold. And this is the boring sort of academic uh, side of things, but also the politics of local and national government, austerity, uh, localism, impact. Uh, the planning frameworks increasingly um, devolved within which communities, not local authorities, are expected to deliver housing, library management, and many other services that were previously um, provided by the state. And the dominant economic mantra that the services that neither um, can neither be met by the state nor by the communities um, is that these things will be outsourced, will be privatized. So we have now um, prisons that are run by private companies, um, some policing services are, um, have been outsourced. And in Sheffield, this also applies to um, the city's roads and trees. Um, which have been outsourced as well. So maintenance, maintenance contracts have been given to private contractor, which has led um, to the felling of um, healthy and mature trees across the city because this private contractor uh, needs to meet um, uh, the companies, no? the global corporate companies' efficiency targets. And this is um, the result here, uh, tree stumps across the city uh, of trees that uh, were just teenagers, really. And of course, um, the politics of ethics, meaning that the making, uh, the production of space along a fairer set of principles cannot be accomplished if responsibility for the management of public or formerly public facilities is simply dumped into the lap of community organizations. So before moving on to um, a contextualization or short discussion of this project, the challenges and limitations maybe of working in ways that are not only reflective but also projective um, by, as I said before, developing uh, a politics of working and intervening, I want to make a very big step away from this in, in order to take a look at why I'm interested in this kind of work and why I have come uh, to, to do it. Um, so. Um, it is this book here that I um, generally hold responsible for um, what became of me and the work I do. And I guess I didn't realize it at the time, but this compendium, one of the few books that were compulsory to, um, to have when I began studying architecture in Germany in the mid-1990s, is symptomatic for uh, what you might want to call an architecture of distance. By having you know, meticulously measured up life from the smallest item to the largest, this book gives aspiring architects, 
and architects, solutions for spatial questions without ever having to leave your desk, your studio, your zone of comfort. And as students, when we got a brief for a house, and it might have happened to you um, as well, uh, I think there's many of such stories around, um, we uh, didn't leave this de desk, we uh, simply opened the book and looked at the appropriate um, page. No? We looked at how big the kitchen should be, how much space was needed uh, for a living room, um, the dimensions of bathrooms, the size of garages, um, and the book had really answers for everything. And um, no, I'm, I'm sure you know the book. It's, it's not only just domestic and residential spaces that are covered. In fact, you can find no, all sorts of things, the perfect dinner table arrangement, the perfect height of a chair, uh, the right dimensions um, for chicken coops and um, the height of lockers, how much space you need when you carry one suitcase or two suitcases um, on your shoulder, in your hands, um, the size of an altar or the position of an altar cross. Uh, so this architecture by proxy, in a way, this architecture of distance, essentially providing blueprints for non-engagement um, with the real world, in inverted commas, began to trouble me intensely. And of course, all of this is rehearsed quite extensively in academic writing, but given my skepticism of the um, intensity of what some have come to describe as deep change in the profession that um, uh, seems to be happening at the moment, I don't think it can be said often enough. So it troubled me and still troubles me because um, I saw those drawings, those measured and therefore also completely controlled spaces, which did not pay attention to the messiness of life or the no, variations in our bodies and uh, postures and um, so on and so forth. Um, uh, as leading directly to this type of architecture that uh, you see depicted here in the photo. It's uh, completed, it's a closed form, it's neat and tidy, it's perfect um, around every single corner and so on and so forth. So things essentially are always no, impenetrable, unchangeable, they're these uh, Gesamtkunstwerke, if you wish, islands really, uh, often in the most literal sense. And of course, they photograph nicely, but understanding them only on an aesthetic level, on a level of form, um, is missing a point. Arguably, actually, looking at aesthetics only is dangerous, and of course, we all know that, I guess, as it negates the wider networks and relationships um, embedded in, um, within which buildings are embedded in and a product of. And these forms, these finished objects, um, however fulfill, um, I came to realize a distinct purpose in the world. They are products of a particular economic system that sees and uses buildings as commodities. What I mean by that, of course, is that when architecture is reduced to, um, to this, to this object beautiful and even of course, beauty is debatable here. It is appropriated into the commodity exchange of the marketplace where you have progressive buildings, iconic buildings, landmark buildings, um, efficient no, buildings, and all of that seems to carry a higher exchange value. So in other words, they serve those who can finance, market, and also sell those buildings. And of course, this is all much more complex than this, but it made me question, I guess, being a first and second year student, um, what and whom I would be producing my designs for, uh, would be making my drawings for, and also made me question what kind of architect I guess I wanted to be. Um, but there was more to it, of course, than that. It fundam fundamentally changed my perspective on architecture, and I became interested in exploring um, why architecture was actually made like this, why it was sold like this, and why it was portrayed like that. So more and more I wondered um, about the wider production of space, which was much bigger, of course, than what the architectural magazines I was reading as a student of architecture were perpetuating. And read this image here, which shows a situation in Glasgow in Scotland in the late 1990s as a placeholder of, um, for this growing concern with this wider spatial realm, with planning and economies, with ideologies, planning ideologies, with um, land distribution and the politics of land distribution, and the role architects play uh, within these fields to um, name just a few concerns that began to creep into my work. And the work that came then out of this student work still was more and more fueled by this intense engagement with these concerns and the histories and theories and power, money, elites also, which are inextricably linked to the making of space. 
Um, at the same time, this work was not just abstract, and by abstract, I mean you know, in, in sort of in the drawings or projects I made at, at university, but it was directly driven also by what was happening in, in um, my own backyard at the time. So I was living in Glasgow, and I've been talking a little bit about this already today, and what was happening there in the late 1990s what, was that the city of Glasgow was in um, the process of um, privatizing many public services, but also its entire housing stock. So um, social, previously social housing was um, transferred to private housing providers. Um, there were stories about motorways being planned um, and proposed, um, driven through existing neighborhoods, so planning stories that you think um, were actually closed. Uh, had been closed in the 1970s, but there we are, were in, in the late 1990s in Glasgow, and motorways were being built. Public facilities were being um, privatized, including swimming pools, which is um, this one here, um, to be replaced by privately run healthcare providers. And in all of this, I think I was missing the voice of the architect. And to be very honest, I am still very often missing the voice of architects in, in, in these discussions. So here um, you know, was a city uh, which made fundamental decisions about the built environment, about the spaces and places where we lived, worked, and which were used for all sorts of reasons. But the astonishing thing really was that the architects, the body of architects in the city and beyond were happy enough to make proposals for the new housing schemes, for the new swimming pools, for the new communi community facilities but were entirely silent about the consequences of their interventions. Nobody really looked at, let alone articulated, what these new buildings would do to existing neighborhoods or socio-spatial structures, or what a restructuring of services um, or the privatization of many previously public facilities would mean for existing populations. Um, so many of these architects we encountered back then were all too happy to have another well-paid job. So um, this, for me, began a period of, um, of work that was dominated by two aspects. So on the one hand, with two others, and Kim mentioned this, I founded an architectural workers' cooperative, um, which addressed um, this professional silence and um, worked directly with those concerns. And the manifesto that you see here in the photo on, uh, on the right um, uh, outlines the ambitions for this type of, for the practice that we, um, that we were um, having. Uh, we um, no, but we were also founded on very different principles. We, um, our legal structure was a cooperative. We um, said explicitly that we wanted to work with um, the people around us that were affected by top-down planning decisions. Um, we wanted to challenge privatizi privatizing and neoliberalizing tendencies, um, uh, and we also wanted to talk to different um, different audiences um, and. Um, therefore set up this journal, which was free, was distri distributed across the city to community centers, libraries, and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, um, I also began to engage more intensely with the wider context of practice, research, and pedagogy, as well as architectural education, questioning more and more, I guess, what was and what not was not possible within certain frameworks, um, what institutions allowed or didn't allow, and so on. Uh, now, did I consider this um, social engagement or activist research? Do I consider it as such today? Um, I would have to say no, not really, um, absolutely not. If I had to give it a label, which I'm not keen on, I would consider this way of working to be about um, a political decision I made, not only on a personal level, but also on a professional one. And this brings me to um, um, another part of my presentation in which I'll move away again from this deeply personal concern towards a discussion of the wider concerns that I have alluded to uh, throughout. And let's say this part now opens maybe a new chapter of this presentation which will deal um, a little bit laterally with those issues that Kim um, asked me to, to look at, the social activism, social engagement, uh, more directly, and um, I'm sure we can pick that up again in, in the discussion afterwards. So um, social engagement, social architecture, socially minded architecture, social impact design, there are so many, many words around us as that, that not as, a, as a total have emerged as quite a powerful force in, in recent years, maybe over the past 10 years or so. And of course, um, but without being very explicit about it, you could say that the 
bits and pieces of work that I've been showing so far all fall within this framework of uh, what maybe in the literature is cons um, no, discussed as this social turn in architecture. Projects uh, such as um, this research project in the beginning, as well as the more pedagogical examples, they've become part of this vocabulary, um, a certain way of operating, almost instantly recognizable also, uh, not least through the photos uh, that capture process and people rather than a final and shiny product. Um, object or building. And my bookshelf, uh, and you see just a small part of this here, is, pil is, is filled with you know, testimonies of um, testimonials as well um, to that um, social turn in a way. There's exhibition catalogs, project documentations, um, out of which documenting and conceptualizing uh, this works. And I have, you no, know, we all, you probably all have these books, maybe not, but I have books that are called uh, the Other Architect, <laughs> which is, of course, a CCA publication. Uh, what Design Can Do, a very crucial one for me, too. Uh, tactical Urbanism, Short-Term Action for Long-Term Change, Design for the 99%, Design Like You Give a Damn, Uneven Growth, Tactical Urbanisms for Expanding Mega Cities, Inclusive Urbanization, Good Design, Community Service Through Architecture, um, Small Scale, Big Change, um, architecture, building social change, and the list goes on and on and on and on. So some of the strong recurring themes, of course, of those publications and the theories they put forward concern uh, situatedness, and I've talked about this before. Um, so think back to this urban room that I showed in, in, in the beginning, LifeWorks in, in Sheffield. So um, one is situated in, in the city rather than in the ivory towers of education. One is embedded in, uh, in certain, uh, it's a very affirmative um, uh, process. And um, there's, um, there's uh, then other aspects within that literature, which is about challenging class or patriarchal relationships. They talk about the importance also of networks and processes before you engage material concerns. Um, there is also talk about social justice uh, through spatial interventions, um, um, in, 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 interstices that are celebrated as beholding the power to trigger big change, and um, there's a lot of claims about resilient forms of design uh, combating climate change, and others um, argue that a choice of even a specific um, material might diminish inequality. So um, there's lots of writers, of course, that suggest that this rise of such concern um, ought to be understood as, um, and we talked about this before also, there's a critique of, arch of the architecture profession, the, the top-down planning, the allegiances with the elites that architects hold, uh, buildings being produced as commodities, so for the exchange value rather than their social use value. And socially engaged architecture then often refers to a range of approaches um, that um, some people call conscious planning. Others um, talk about um, no, a renewed interest in, um, in the social value of architecture. Um, and um, no, it's come to stand for um, impactful, people-centered, and um, of course is also championed by powerful cultural organizations, including no, the Guggenheim, the Museum of Modern Art, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, and, and other big foundations. So you could also say, no, what's not to like? Why are we not simply embracing this, uh, uh, this turn towards um, something um, that seems to be better than these closed um, uh, buildings that um, uh, I've showed earlier? Um, so why, why is it not something that can be just simply embraced? Well, there's a lot, um, I think, that speaks um, against this. And the more I've been immersed, I think, in these discussions, and the bigger my unease is about this field. Why? Well, um, I'd argue that despite much smoke around this fundamental uh, change in outlook, or this alleged uh, change in outlook, uh, so this change from uh, when we talked about star architects um, until a few years ago to maybe uh, architecture as a collaborative discipline uh, nowadays, uh, this a social turn in inverted commas has not really managed, I think, to go beyond its good intentions. And um, just look around you, um, Montreal is no exception, I think. Uh, you see how very little has actually changed in um, how um, buildings go up. Um, on plots within our cities. 
What's even worse when looking more closely is that many projects of the social turn are not producing the fairer or more democratic, more collaborative produced spaces that they promised, but instead have become to um, have come to play into the hands of those forces they were critical of at the outset. Uh, so um, now we could um, look at the radical nature and aesthetics maybe of, 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 of no, beach bars and pop-up things and meanwhile uses when they first came up maybe in the early 2000s um, you know, or came up again. Um, but uh, many have been completely absorbed by the branding and marketing mechanisms of uh, our corporate city still. So um, this is an example here from London, um, Exist. Um, intervention over a couple of years, over the summer, temporarily vacant site uh, where the group was allowed by the landowner to um, co-produce this um, nice, um, these nice functions for the city, completely open. You didn't have to pay. There was a small paddling pool in that year. So um, no, this might be seen as this expression of this social turn in many uh, different ways, a right to the city even, where you um, begin to shape parts of um, your city uh, together, collaboratively, but, um, but then on, on the right-hand side, a couple of years later, when the economy was back up again, uh, the thing is gone. And, um, uh, in the process of being replaced by quite a standard housing scheme. And um, I think it's not only that which bugs me, it seems also that you know, history repeats itself. There's widespread historic amnesia, and this was mentioned already um, in the morning. There's a lack of, I think, historical engagement with, um, with certain forms of critical practice that um, came up maybe in the 1960s and 70s, and the very critical agendas they um, brought forward, uh, such as the, um, this House Rucker scheme for the Documenta in Kassel in 1972, um, which was an environmental critique. Um, um, but also um, no, a critique about how we spend our leisure times. All of that has been completely absorbed by um, no, this popular culture um, from the 1990s, early 2000s, maybe onwards. And add all of this to the thoughts I've offered so far, and we find in front of us, I think, an enormous dilemma from which um, the academy, with its rules and regulations, its research assessment exercises, uh, that are at least partially based on, on these metrics I've mentioned earlier, um, um, are not excluded. So um, yes, I, I fully concur that social engagement offers um, the possibility of actualizing ambitions about um, other forms of imagining space with the aid of design. But uh, here's the thing, I think spatial disciplines um, are and continue to be fundamentally dependent on mechanisms outside of our control and um, no, not limited to, but including ownership structures, political decision making and financial markets. And of course, it is an absolutely not a new observation, but um, it's been discussed intensely. And yet there's a certain stubbornness when it comes to accepting the very existence of those networks, relationships and dependencies, which are nothing, of course, um, but neutral. So um, our Organization of space, political, I said that before, but it's often forgotten when only the social or activism as a label is foregrounded. If this fundamental premise is not acknowledged, especially by um, this recent uh, generation of interventionists, um, again, that design and architecture is a political act, it cannot be challenged, I would argue, or transformed, or in other words, the politics of it cannot be changed, which is necessary if one wants to address wider inequalities, or the, um, what Andy Merrifield calls the, um, the eating away of the social body. And um, I like to use the iceberg um, analogy here. So if you imagine our environment, the production of space as an iceberg, buildings or other interventions as you know, at the tip of this iceberg, they are representations, expressions um, of the underlying systems and values in both an aesthetic and socioeconomic sense. Uh, if one therefore wants to fundamentally change how our environment uh, is produced, um, so what the tip of this iceberg represents, it's not enough to change the looks of the tip um, with a little bit of social engagement. Any intervention, I think, that is interested in true transformation 
uh, needs to understand the entirety of this iceberg, which is what this illustration by uh, Georges Cross from 1932 for me points to. No? It's very important to ask questions that who and by whom our cities are currently produced. And of course, no, the city is not a monolith, but who produces certain building spaces and larger entities or territories? Who holds the power to make decisions and why, what, and who finances the spaces that we find ourselves in? And uh, what are the roles that we as architects play or academics play in the system? Uh, are we, through certain actions, reinforcing patterns, hierarchies, um, and dependencies, and so on? I think you all get what I'm talking about. So I'm not saying that one can change the iceberg from above. This is um, quite popular now that we say, well, we uh, design nice buildings and sub subsequently all social structures will change and no, everything will be reformed. That is not what I'm saying. Um, a different building, a different aesthetic um, uh, cannot really change what lies beneath um, the surface. What I'm arguing for is that there is a need for a transversal approach. So what, an approach that addresses the entire iceberg. And um, I always like to point to the um, cross-border initiative by Teddy Cruz and Fona Forman uh, here, um, which um, goes beyond um, these um, boundaries and uh, limitations, never leaving sight of the larger picture. Um, so this is the moment, I guess, at which it becomes quite clear that my position as a researcher, educator, or rather citizen um, in relation to the social and social engagement in architecture becomes essentially a means to confront, um, uh, but at the very least reveal the forces and powers of neoliberalization. And it is a position that is rooted in a certain theoretical framework, of course, the writings of um, Neil Brenner, to name but one, who talks about the necessity for the redesign of urban spaces to go hand in hand with the redesign of institutions, um, um, is, is one of the things that um, I'm really interested in. So um, I'm coming to a close. I need another couple of minutes. With this in mind, I want to briefly come back to the research project that I began introducing earlier on, which I understand, as you might begin to see not only as what is uh, what it is on the surface, so it's not just a research project, but for me it's a mechanism, it's a, it's a tool, it's an instrument um, um, to develop different ways, um, different means um, uh, that have um, the capacity to transform um, and our environment. Something that has um, uh, the capacity, I guess, to transform the way the iceberg is actually conceived. So I said this earlier, the point of this work for me is to change um, the politics. So it's not about the social, it's not about activism, but it's about changing the politics that underlie um, certain processes of, of, of making and doing. And this is not just about the types of collaborations one chooses, but also the things one chooses to address in one's work. And um, this all might seem terribly abstract, but um, no, let's go back to what's at stake for um, the wider production of space. So um, what we are doing at the moment with a research project is to use our discursive knowledge, our theoretical frameworks that are generously supported, of course, by the European Union's funding apparatus and the learned knowledge, which we are gaining also from the interviews which we've been conducting. Uh, we're using that to strategically weave together these absolutely wonderful but terribly insular practices that exist. Um, we're focusing on Sheffield at the moment, but I think it's a principle that can be applied elsewhere. So we're using that knowledge to weave together um, these, um, these practices. And um, if you wanted to put a label onto this, um, no, we're using this, I guess, in an activist manner. You, activism, and I'm cautious here, um, because um, maybe because we're pursuing a quite distinct agenda also, and this agenda I outlined earlier. And in order to meet this agenda, um, then we are helping to strengthen existing networks. We're aiding the making of new strategic connections and relations that simply didn't exist before. So we're putting different people in one room together and get them uh, to talk about um, their challenges, their limitations, their, their hopes, their fears for their own um, 
um, practices in the city. Uh, and um, we, um, we are also beginning to act as brokers um, between different organizations um, because we are realizing that very often um, it's, uh, it's knowledge about certain resources that is missing in, in certain practices and um, by, by knowing what is available in one uh, community we can say we can put people together um, so that they can uh, make uh, use of, of that um, um, resource. Uh, I spoke a little bit about education, particularly also about my own architectural education and why I do what I do, um, which I haven't really linked back yet. I guess I haven't done this because it seems to be one of the most obstinate elements in this whole story, despite much and many attempts to the otherwise. Um, architectural education, I think, has remained largely unbothered by reformist educational movements. And this is also true for this seemingly progressive set of modules that Sheffield has developed. They are insular, no? they are modules, just modules. They're not connected, really. They might be connected to the overall curriculum, but it's not about the entire curriculum. And very often, these individual units are too short to really be able to engage uh, with the issues that are at stake in the city. And they follow a different time frame. They are uh, two different um, um, intensities. So yes, when you look at architectural representation, there have been plenty of um, change in, in, in the graphics or in the looks of things. But the underlying system, the rituals, the privileging of the visual, the modes of behavior continue to be um, in stasis, I would say. So when this recent interest in liveness, life pedagogy, life projects seem to suggest that architectural education has progressed beyond um, those narrow interests, the contrary, I would argue, is true. The very core of it is still left unchallenged. So I said earlier that the organization of space is political, and of course this is true for education. Education certainly in the UK, but also in all those other schools of architecture that hold RABA accreditation, remains in the thrall of these narrow interests of quite an elitist profession, a profession which is still predominantly aged, a middle-aged, um, white men uh, that continue to dictate uh, what education should be about. And that is then also one of the biggest problems with the research project I'm part of. It creates, in a way, another bubble, another island within this um, already, already fragmented um, landscape of education and research that might simply eventually become submerged by other concerns um, when the funding comes to an end. And on top of that, one also has to say that the kind of education that we um, are after cannot be mobilized um, within the existing framework, cannot really be actualized in a piecemeal fashion because it's, um, no, it's about the politics of that education. So as it stands, it seems a bit of a stalemate, indifferent uh, as to where uh, things should go or whom it should um, actually serve, architectural education that is. So this is my last slide, uh, the slide I want to conclude with. Um, this quite no, fragmented presentation in many ways as well. It's an advertisement by, by Marlboro that was plastered on billboards across um, Europe back in 2016, I think. Uh, and I believe that um, no, in a world that places emphasis on the power of you, no, here in this picture, it's your responsibility whether you want to smoke or not, it is you who, um, no, they say it is you who should be making this choice and not some government or some um, public health body. Um, in this context where no, we're pushed to make, to individualize and fragmentize, there's the danger of losing sight of those larger networks and relations I've been talking about. It's great to make um, no, a personal choice and personal decision, and I think it's also really important to be clear about why you do what you do. Um, and why one might want to address an issue in one's own backyard. Um, so the interventionist, interventionist projects that make um, no, your street a little bit nicer or do one of those pretty ephemeral micro installations that we have become so accustomed to, I think they're important in many ways, but um, I think um, this is missing um, the point a little bit. There are much bigger issues at stake uh, which cannot be addressed by those small, insularized, object-focused solutions that are falling into the same pattern as uh, the architecture I was uh, critical of in the beginning. And in fact, um, I think we have a 
collective responsibility to come up with ways of doing that address this complexity, making it visible, unraveling it whenever possible. So let me therefore end um, with a plea to each and every one of you. Uh, consider collaborative, collaboratively, collectively, the iceberg, and not just parts of it, but all of it. It really is um, increasingly urgent and in everyone's interest to counter um, this relentless commodification, privatization, and neoliberalization of our environments. And that's me. Last one up. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Tatiana, for uh, making the groundwork and making sense of uh, the social turn in um, architecture and urban research, uh, both through an institutional and personal uh, lens um, to propose um, politics of it. Um, I think there's much to discuss also with regard to um, Young, yeah, um, since we're in a re um, format of thinking through research and historiographic and theoretical research, how to um, formulate that into strategies, um, what kind of um, agency the research can have. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that is something I put up for discussion, but um, as I introduced um, this um, for respondents, I um, kindly invited to, um, to participate in um, kicking off this discussion. So um, I want to open the floor uh, for first questions. Yes, I think uh, four climbers to uh, attack the iceberg. Maybe we can start with uh, Alan here, who's lucky enough to sit on my left. Okay. I, I want to say thanks again for the, the wonderful talk. Um, I guess for me, there are quite a few different uh, provocations that I think you bring up. Um, for me, I'm sort of reminded of Manfredo Tapuri's uh, Architecture and Utopia and, and how he sort of identifies um, the architect um, as a new political agent. As a? As a new political agent. Like, the architect, um, with, in reference to the city, has now become um, uh, more than just the architect. It, it's, it, it's, it, it, their role exceeds just the profession and has become some, somewhat of a political actor. Um, and so, maybe to pr provoke a bit of discussion, I have several copious notes about things, um, but I'll try to contextualize that briefly. Um, of the many different textures of social engagement, uh, the domain of socially aware architecture seems the most ripe for capitalist recuperation, um, precisely because of the commodity value associated with progressive thinking or socially responsible uh, building. Um, so with that in mind, to the extent that the city is an expression or a manifestation of neoliberal desire, I think it's important to contextualize that in that way, um, access to resources uh, and the kinds of mobility associated with modes of, of, of modernity. Um, has architecture, as an expert practice, and it's exactly what gives it its, its sort of commodity value in a sense, um, uh, has it taken on too much in identifying itself as an appropriate and effective uh, political actor or agent? That, that, that is a, Say that again. Has it taken on too much? Yeah, has it taken on too much in identifying itself? within this sort of political realm of uh, socially engaged um, building and so forth. And has it exceed, are there areas where architecture or the architect through the discipline is exceeding sort of its, its, its actual um, competence, competence, competency um, in dealing with the, the, the sort of larger fabric of, uh, in the larger textures, I would say, of, of capitalist engagement with the city, for instance. Um, urbanism is more than architects building socially, you know, building high lines in New York City and, and creating leisure spots for the well-to-do class, right? Um, so, anyway, in, in any case, what I'm trying to say is, what, are, are there points where architect, architects, um, through the discipline and through trying to be socially engaged, um, has exceeded its competency? Yeah, I'm not quite sure how to answer. I think there's it's many. A you know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a point of discussion. Yeah, I mean, yeah. people can weigh okay. in on that or, mm. you know. Yeah, maybe just take it. Yeah. Um, 
one what I mean to continue what you've just said though if the issues go beyond architecture can architecture exist simply on its own or must it link up with the other agents that are determining the nature of society and its values. In other words, you're making the argument that by itself, architecture is too limited. The, the, the demands that are necessary to change society go way beyond. So the question is, how can one find the place of architecture with other agents? And how does one go about doing that? Is that back to me? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I, there's no straightforward answer to, to any of those things, I guess. No? I, I think you're absolutely right that certain architects are no, sort of overstepping, in, in a way, their competencies in, in sort of trying to be everything and thereby also losing sight of that bigger picture or taking on responsibilities that are simply outside of um, maybe a core responsibility. And on the other hand, I guess there's also limits to that um, um, that model whereby architects are simply just another agent within um, um, a, a wider set of, of actors. But um, um, it's a, I, I guess it's a, what, what my particular position entails, I guess, is, um, is this um, uh, awareness of, um, of certain limitations. So I would, I would lean towards the position whereby architects become part of a wider set of experts of which, um, everyone who has a stake um, is, is part of. But, um, but of course, um, this would have to, it's not a model, I, I would say, no? I may perhaps raise another issue, which seems to me that implicit in your talk is the need for social activism, and yet you would claim that you're not suggesting that. Mm -hmm. It seems to me you're saying that Theoretical research is inadequate to deal with society's problems. There must be more practical orientation of actually working with solutions in practice, dealing with the various issues facing society. But then you turn around and argue. So in other words, you're suggesting there is a need for that, but yet then you turn around and suggest that that's not what you're suggesting. I'm not suggesting to, to call it social engagement. I don't think that these terms and labels are, are helpful because they are, again, limiting um, something to but are a you certain suggesting, thing. But are you suggesting more social action? I'm su suggesting action, no? which, can be, which does not have to be social. Well, everything has, is social sooner is or it? later. Is it? Everything is political. Everything is cultural. Yeah. No, I wouldn't want to use the term social. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, I'm pretty interested in the issue of the institution. And you were talking about institutions in terms of education, of the academy, and your work develops also um, on this kind of bottom-up, informal interventions in the city. And <clears throat> somehow, I think that <clears throat> the interventions, this kind of bottom-up interventions, participatory interventions, they work because somehow they disinstitutionalize the process. They are much more direct, much more straightforward in terms of the impacts of the process. Uh, they don't have to deal with all the legal and uh, institutional uh, issues normally. And that's the, the positive and, and, the, and the active point. But when we talk about uh, institutions and the involvement of institutions like universities and, and municipalities and uh, groups of students and communities, this seems like hell a little bit. How to involve all these, all these agents and all these institutions without questioning the, the institution, without an idea of a new kind of institution. I would like to ask you if you think about this idea of the possibility of a new kind of institution and how 
can it make it work? Because we work with institutions, mm -hmm. inside institutions. Yeah. And how can that work? And yeah. how do you I guess, again, I don't have a, a solid answer to that, no? but I think we've seen in, in recent years a, a lot of um, uh, projects, again, that question the static model of education, so most recently or currently ongoing, of course, the um, floating university in Berlin, which Raumlabor has been um, uh, has set up, which is this um, space in the city that is for everyone to use and to, to set up their own um, 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 teaching formats, their own content, and, you know, and you enroll without fees or any such thing. No? So of course there's, there's many models. No? Um, it, it, it links back to, I guess, to the professionalization also of architecture. Um, the kind of institution that might then also be maybe seen to be uh, adequate, maybe or so. But um, but certainly, I would I would I would see um, uh, yeah scope to change. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the talk again. I just want to start from maybe the final image uh, that a really sort of incredible ad in a very strange, yeah. sort of disquieting way. And just sort of going back to that issue of uh, the institution, but also um, something that sort of um, was mentioned many times in this sort of issue of um, sort of the relationship between um, temporariness and localism um, and sort of the limits of both in a sense. I mean, so this advertisement uh, and it's the first time I'm seeing it, but I'm assuming is also is a response to uh, a policy that was proposed uh, uh, by the European Union to limit uh, limit so sort of the advertising capacity and the sort of this the sign uh, capacity of uh, of cigarette brands. So uh, the proposition was that in 10 years uh, all the brands would have the same label. So it's either a white label or it's a very reduced sort of iconography. Uh, so Marlboro can't advertise anymore with the same Marlboro iconography. And the only way, let's say, you don't know the Marlboro logo, to know that this is a cigarette ad is by the cautionary uh, statement at the very bottom. Uh, and so the reason and sort of the, the, uh, um, the claim behind such a policy was that uh, this sort of shift or this like withdrawal of visuality or iconography is in order for uh, teenagers, so it's in, it's in order to stop future smokers, so in order to like, so it's, it's really sort of an act in, in order to, you know, that sort of like anticipates or sort of acts upon the futurity of possible continuation of smokers, so it's not for smokers who already know smoking. Um, and this, I think, sort of this issue of you know of the future. So if you brought up uh, many times, and I think it's uh, sort of as you said, it's a really contested, uh, contested territory. And sort of recently, a lot of people have been sm speaking both in architecture and non strictly architectural terms about, um, you know, sort of what um, um, you know the future versus the near future. You know, the, is there a, is there an inherent politicality to temporariness, uh, to disruption? Uh, I mean, one can also say in regard to, regarding to the institution that actually maybe precisely uh, one of the things that are um, uh, sort of worrying in a sense is that in architecture, in academia, in art, one has been adopting more and more the language of you know from uh, from you know the temporary public artwork to the work in progress to etc there's a there's a diversion away from let's say previously more ideological taking positions taking a final decision a final form we've been shifting more towards this sort of indeterminate ambiguity of temporary actions of so i'm just wondering how these sort of con like how these temporal uh, temporal issues like how do you th how do you see these um, um, you know, sort of the limits of temporariness, in a sense. That, yeah. Gosh. <laughs> limits of temporariness. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I really, I, I have no idea how to answer no? um, this. Um, I, I guess um, there is, there is, there is something about, uh, regardless of of how long something might be, but there is something in in any action. Um, which, which um, probably links back to intentions, links back to uh, the knowledge you might have in terms of um, just intervening. Just very, very often, I guess, you find that uh, projects, um, and I'm, yeah, I'm generalizing very, very badly here, no? but um, temporary projects do not necessarily consider the wider implications. Or then, when you go back, um, and or when you when you look back onto a temporary intervention, the, the benefits or the uh, consequences of those interventions are massively overclaimed. So I, I guess my, my issue is, is really much more with, um, with, a, with the claims that are being made about the consequences of certain interventions than with the, the temporariness of certain interventions um, as such. Yeah, so when we find that um, you know, an intervention that took place for an hour in, on, on a Saturday afternoon and, uh, in, a, no, in an empty field or so, and you find then academic articles about it that claim, um, make claims about the agency of, uh, of those actions in, 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 in wider societal you know, um, uh, issues, I, this is where my, my problem comes in. I don't think there is an issue as such with, with temporariness or ephemerality, but with um, the, um, the, the, the notions and concepts and, um, and, and claims that we attach to certain things, if that answers a little bit. Statement about, about the temporariness. I think you can also problematize temporariness in the, in the sense that the character of the ad hoc, the character of makeshift, um, yeah, uh, temporary solutions, sort of like an adult environment, um, are easily commodified. They can become ar architectural gestures that someone can sort of um, uh, be build a vocabulary out of and, and sort of trend um, into a space of, of just pure, like, uh, insubstantial engagement with the environment. So I think there is probably a, a, a level of um, uh, critique that can be made about the, the form of temporariness in a sense, I mean, because it's so recuperable within a capitalist regime. I can add something to that. I was thinking about your work with the, the collective in, in Glasgow, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the kinds of things you did. You mentioned the journal, but looking back on it now, what you see as the more somehow important or, or influential of the work? Well, I guess one of the most important things was really the journal. No, because the, the, the journal, which came out, I think, 10 times or so over, over seven years, um, was, um, was a means to capture conversations we had in and throughout Glasgow. It was, um, it was testing different, different formats of, of writing. It was not just us writing, but, um, but very often it was, um, it was um, also um, the, um, the people and groups and organizations we, um, we actually worked with um, that added um, their voice to this. Um, it, I, I said before, I think, that um, it tested, um, so it was not just academic, but we used the, the language of the city as well, so Glasgow being a very, um, um, humorous city as well, really dark humor as well. So we we used spoof ads, we used um, small ads to capture sort of different imaginations, I guess, about uh, about the city and um, and and the issues that we found in the city. And because it was um, distributed so widely um, in the city, I think it, it captures more most clearly, I guess, the spirit of this um, breaking away um, out of, out of um, certain architectural formats, out of certain, certain sort of glossy format. So we, we started in, in 2000 when it was not very common to do these kind of tabloid magazines that, um, that were um, also um, free. So we had an architectural journal that was a newspaper style that was uh, um, where you would normally also not find um, newspapers, as I said, no swimming pools, community centers, and um, and yeah, I guess the the collaborative production, the uh, the kind of issues that we raised, the way we distributed it, um, is, is most most clearly, I think, an ex expression of 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 that cooperative as well, and the spirit of the cooperative. So 
I would say that that is one of the most important outcomes and the most lasting one, I guess, as well, because you, you'll you still find, um, so speaking of temporariness, no, it's it's one of the things that um, I still find in, in people's cupboards, no, or going back to class school now 10 years or 15 years later, um, uh, the, one of the chippies, um, uh, fish and chips um, no, shops that um, participated, she still has no, one of the issues um, in her cabinet. No? So it's, it's there, it, it, it remained, it's, it's, it's lasting and um, had a real impact, I think, on, on, uh, on people that we were working with, uh, feeling that they were taken serious, no? that um, the concerns they had were uh, not just um, localized, were not just um, in their neighborhoods, but were taken out of it and presented to a wider no, audience. Um, I, I would like only to uh, ask, uh, uh, it's a kind of curiosity that I have, uh, in terms of the Glass Manifesto, because the, it's a manifesto, and the manifest, manifesto is a historical device. And if you think that the manifesto is a way of engaging society, uh, is still relevant. Uh, there was a huge debate about your yeah. manifesto recently, I would like to know your okay. idea. So um, the manifesto itself, which I also showed in the picture, was not a means um, to engage society, but it, I think it was more for us as the uh, cooperative to, to find common ground. We wanted to set our own uh, limits, our own ambitions, and make those clear uh, to others who wanted to no, engage with us. So it was first and foremost uh, a means to for us to define ourselves. Intentional, yeah. Um, I, working? Um, I wanted to ask you about the, um, the role that buildings uh, played uh, within your um, research. Um, I think when you said that uh, sort of like the effects of socially oriented practices have kind of failed and we see that and the built environment through how that here in Montreal towers are popping up as in any other city. Um, I, would, I would guess that it in some point uh, has to do with a certain indifference that spatial thinkers have been giving to the medium of the building. I don't think architects only do buildings, um, but I think it's not like any object in the tradition of uh, our profession or our discipline, let's say. Um, and I think one can do, because buildings are interesting objects, they, I mean, one can use them as sensors to, where one can register political issues, economic issues by analyzing them, right? Uh, but one can also use, they are also like agents. Things are exercised through them. Uh, and um, so I, I think one can work with buildings, not only designing and building them, but like deeply understanding and analyzing them. Um, so I just wanted to ask, what, what is the, the role of the medium of the building within the context of your work? Um, the building is important as well, no, because, because for me, working, working maybe from, from those no, um, bottom parts of the iceberg upwards, um, they are expressions also of, um, let's say, a potentially different financial system, a, a different governance structure, different maintenance structure that might be implemented. So um, um, I've been looking at housing specifically, um, also um, in the Swiss context, but also in the German context, where first and foremost, um, um, buildings are designed through um, systems of financing and governance before they become then the objects of architecture. So um, in that regard, no, the architecture is then a reflection also or works backwards with these um, different concepts of, um, uh, of, of, um, of democracies that may be also different um, uh, financial structures um, um, bring about, mm -hmm. if I'm making myself clear. No? So it's, I think buildings play a really important part. So for, for a while, I guess, they've, been, uh, they've not really been in the limelight mm -hmm. in, in, in much of that work around um, social engagement or what it might be. But um, I'd say that especially in terms of housing, there has been quite a market shift 
towards um, um, understanding um, no, everything from land and um, uh, how, how land ownership is, is a fundamental part of no, the production of something and, and then the, the objects that come, come with that uh, alongside. Do you think that um, if the architect that comes at the end, so after the financial ground was set up, okay. No, it's, it's often in parallel. In parallel, okay. Yeah, but do you think parallel. the architect has an agency there to work within those yes. given systems? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So if you, if you, um, if you look at, at Switzerland, and uh, especially the context of, of Zurich maybe and, and Basel, where um, there was, um, because of a housing affordability crisis, I guess you, you could say there was... Um, um, a wide, a quite wide alliance was set up between politicians, but also um, uh, non-profit foundations, uh, political actors, but also architectural offices that were together campaigning for a certain you know, for a system to be reformed. So um, the architects were fundamental in these initial processes of changing the politics of how building took place. So, in, so this Genossenschaft in Switzerland, would, would you say there are uh, like a certain kind of model that one can think through? Or? Not just the uh, Genossenschaft, not just the cooperative, but I think these, um, these alliances and, and, and syndicates that have made these um, cooperatives possible. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think, I think that's really interesting because it feels like it comes closest to presenting uh, a new model for confronting the iceberg. Like I feel like what we've had a lot of discussion on already is the problematics that come from what we've seen over the last 20 years, which also to me seem to just illustrate the frameworks in which we're trying to operate. And so I'm wondering if there are, I guess, any other means or modes that you see architects working in besides this uh, strategy of connecting up with groups within a given political situation that, that we can learn from, from a, I guess from a practice perspective, how we are looking forward to, to, to these other modes? Hmm. Well, I, so again, all of that, is not really straightforward, and everything comes with its flaws. But I think um, the practice of Lacaton Vassal is, is for me one of the most interesting one in, in terms of uh, looking at um, uh, ref refurbishment, keeping buildings. I guess there's different different uh, setups now, no? and and uh, in order to realize um, many of their schemes, and they've been criticized for other things as well, no? but they um, they have a very deeply rooted understanding of the, uh, the financing of, um, let's say, the social housing system or the, uh, uh, the, uh, the legal structures underpinning, the, um, uh, um, underpinning um, certain um, um, spatial distributions. So um, I guess this is a, another model of an architect maybe that, that um, you mentioned that before, an architect that um, operates in, in many, many different fields no? and knows of these um, different pots, so they are uh, activating then um, uh, no? the legal frameworks, the financial setups, or specific building systems in order to, um, to do something, something then differently. Yeah? So this, is, this would be another one in addition to maybe those um, uh, in, in the housing context, and uh, I'm sure other people can contribute also other models, but these are maybe the most pleasant uh, ones. Um, I have a question, I guess, following up on a question that was asked a few questions ago. Um, the issue of whether or not architecture can make a direct political change, or whether or not somehow architects are sort of just working within the system that they're giving to realize the project, like how much real change, systematic change, architects have. And I guess it's a question of agency too. But in the readings that we had, we had three readings for today, uh, the manifesto and then uh, design for improvement and austerity urbanism. I noticed in the two longer readings that um, most of the interventionist architecture, we called it, uh, intervened after a crisis. And it seemed like it was, in a way, 
doing cleanup work for capitalism? Doing? Cleanup work for capitalism. Like there was the crisis of uh, the housing crisis post Katrina was an example. Um, and I thought back to Teferi as well. He talks about the housing crisis uh, in the Weimar Republic right? and the way yeah. that architects tried to respond to that. And they ended up just making these sort of inhumane housing projects that seemed to allow capitalism to continue marching on even more efficiently. So I was wondering if architecture you think might be kind of um, framing itself as an interventionist discipline, the one that's sort of condemned to only intervene after a crisis caused by capitalism, the sort of system that it's trying to resist in the first place. And in, that seems to really situate it in this kind of dilemma where it's actually allowing the capitalist system, I guess, to just sort of keep turning on while it does the cleanup work, right? We make sort of like gentrify the neighborhood in New Orleans after Katrina and allow that market to boom again. So I was wondering if there might be any examples of architecture that uh, is interventionary, sort of pre-crisis, I guess you could say. And it's just an open question, I guess. Yeah. I was just thinking about this when I was doing the readings and after listening to some of the questions. You have to think about that. I, I have a question, um, which I, I guess is thinking about the 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 makeup of the of the group here for the toolkit, which is mostly composed of uh, students of history, of architectural history. Yeah. So I'm wondering what role do you see uh, history and historic the historian's practice playing in reframing the political? Because the lesson of the iceberg, I think, was not necessarily the social or activism as such, but I think you said reframing the terms and content of the political in a way. And so I'm wondering, you know, either in your own work or in other examples, is there any examples you can think of today in which you see history playing an important role? Historical narrative, the practice of history, of history writing, I'm not quite sure what you're specifically asking, whether there is a an example today that makes use specifically. Well, do you see a role for history? I mean, do you see a role for history in in rethinking the the kind of political terms um, that we operate in today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry if that's not been clear. Yes. Yeah. No? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I do see history as as important. No. So I, I think I talked about the um, um, this historical amnesia that that exists. No. That we're sort of constantly reinventing things and claiming things to be new when and, and of course no, the the world we find ourselves in is, is maybe different to five year, five years ago, ten years ago, fifty years ago, and so on and so forth. No. But I think it's 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 still very useful to to understand um, uh, the emergence of um, of uh, certain countercultural examples in, in the 1960s or understand um, certain uh, reformist movements in the in the 1920s and um, many of the more um, uh, inverted commas maybe progressive foundations to they make um, make um, make use of, um, of 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 literature and other things that go back no, into the 19th century, and I guess Marx is a constant no, reminder in all of those things as well, and Engels too. So that it, it's not just um, um, yeah. So this level of history, I guess, is is there as well. How much uh, maybe certain ideas um, um, influence um, today's practices as well. So yes, an absolute important role for, for history and understanding um, why certain concepts maybe also emerged. No? Why do we have, um, why did participatory practices come about? What were they a response of? And maybe they all came out of certain crisis moments. I don't know whether that, that is an issue as, as such, no? whether uh, there's a problem with uh, this coming out of crisis, but um, the way you then, uh, no? maybe um, turn that crisis moment into, into something or make it resistant to certain appropriations. Yeah. Um, well, my question perhaps kind of latches on a little bit uh, on, onto that one um, and would be asking you more sort of precisely what you see your role as a kind of historian slash theorist 
in that kind of particular project that you've kind of outlined, if you could talk a little bit more about that, and I'm thinking in particular uh, about what you were saying about, I suppose, this situated character of these uh, practices um, that you're investigating, and perhaps, you know, does your historical work in a way try to sort of systematize, understand, you know, does it want to, in a way, kind of deduct a kind of universalizable sort of knowledge? What is it that you're sort of trying to, uh, I suppose, understand in kind of comparing, looking at these sort of different yeah. uh, practices? Okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's not comparative, no? I, I guess um, it's... Um, the more and more I, I do this, the less um, certain I think I am about no, how, to, how to actually approach it. Because obviously we're, we're dealing with um, a compar comparability of, of what, no? what? What are we actually looking at? Are we looking at the people that were actually doing it? Are we looking at um, uh, the, the processes they were using? Um, there are different geographies as, at stake, different cultures, different political contexts. All of that, I think, can be uh, narrativized. And I think this is, this is what I'm interested in, to, to turn these things uh, these these experiences, I guess, also into 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 narratives, so that they can be understood from today's perspective. So I guess my role as a historian, no, I, I see in in, uh, in in explaining, explicating as much as possible a particular project, um, its precise context, its precise collabor collaborators, and the way it try to achieve what it might have achieved, no? according to the knowledge I can gain in the languages that I speak. No? So um, I think there's so many different parameters, but, but this is, I think, at the core, no? to, to put together as, as concise a picture from my perspective as a researcher as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, which, is not, which will always be partial. At the same time, being quite clear about where these uh, knowledges that I've put together are coming from, no? the sources I've used, why I've started to, um, to put together certain things. And this is why I very often keep talking also about my own background, because it puts into perspective um, the kind of um, trajectory that I might follow also in explicating certain practices. No? So it's, it's um, British historian, 1960s, Edward Hallett Carr, um, who wrote a book about what is history, and he talks um, about um, the historian as um, you know, someone who, um, who has that big, vast ocean in front of him or her. No? And um, what you fish in that ocean depends so much on, um, on not just on, on the person who is no? throwing the tackle, but also no? the kind of um, tackle you use, the kind of position you choose, where you start from, and so on and so forth. So, this is, I think, contextualizing what one does and how one puts together. This is this is one of the core principles for me as a you know? acknowledging my limitations of finding stuff. I guess there's time for another question or two. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, for this presentation. Uh, I also had a question about methodology, and I was thinking about, or maybe it's a definitional question, but anyway, the, the relationship between knowledge and learning. So in your, uh, in the story that you told about uh, being in architecture school and coming against, you know, this kind of book that was so um, problematic, you're describing an experience that is one of learning and exploration. And I'm curious about the relationship between, uh, like where, where does learning happen versus where is knowledge made? And what is the relationship between those two things? Okay. Um, do you want to put that in, is that something that you're interested in or to find that thing in terms of knowledge or learning or? I mean, it seemed to be related to the project that you're currently working on in terms of, 
you know, where is knowledge coming from? Who's making it? How yeah. are they making it? So the question is, wh where is the role of learning in knowledge production? Where's the role of learning? Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, so, sorry, I'm, I don't know. I really don't know how to, how to answer this at the moment. Um, I guess it, knowledge, knowledge in the way, so there's a critique of knowledge, right? With the, uh, with the book of Neufer, no? How knowledge, how certain knowledge, or how knowledge is very often portrayed as this very absolute uh, thing that is, again, like these buildings that I'm so critical of, that is fixed, that is closed, that is presented as this sort of expertise um, um, that is, is unchallengeable in, in many ways. No? And, um, and, and, and learning is about understanding the limitations of, uh, of said knowledge for me. No? So understanding what I said before, it's about understanding what the um, uh, limitations are of that knowledge. Who produced this book and why? No? What, um, what are the effects, how it's used? No? And, and this is then, no? learning is about your own developing a critical capability, I think, to understand what is in front of you. Maybe this is how I would go about it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, for your talk and for making this open to the public. I've learned a lot tonight. Um, and building on this conversation of knowledge and learning, uh, my question is, uh, well, I have many, but I will find the one that I want to ask. Um, I, and I don't know how much this is taken into consideration, but it is in my field, but what is the public's understanding of architecture and the role of the architect? And whose responsibility is it to have this discussion with the public or with the communities? And how do architects support communities and the public in their understanding? Is there a practice that is currently undertaken within your field to, to do this? You're not an architect. No, I'm a public historian. <laughs> public historian, okay. Um, I, I guess when you, um, yeah, when you look at Britain, no? um, there is um, there's a lot of discussion about the value of, no? of architects. But um, this value is, uh, is also very quickly politically undermined. No, so it's a, it's a bit of a love-hate relationship, I guess, between um, no, the value design can bring. Uh, there, is, there used to be a body that, uh, CAVE, the Center for Architecture and the Built Environment, that um, was set up to promote no, and to, um, to, to challenge the, um, the, the, the value of, um, of design in our neighborhoods. There's, there's numerous organizations, actually, um, who, um, who work on a more micro level in, in, in local cities across, across um, um, England um, who, um, who engage in these kind of discussions, setting up workshops. So it, I guess in, in, in the UK, it's, it's much more to um, yeah. private sectors nowadays. There used to be something, CAPE used to be um, government sponsored, but the uh, government stopped sponsoring, so the, the center sort of came, no? fell apart. Um, it's, it's now down to um, individual organizations um, doing that. Uh, and um, and hmm, universities also promoting the role of so is there public a, outreach. A part of uh, education for architects and architectural historians to understand how to communicate with the public and what their role is there? I guess this is kind of open to everybody in the room. Yeah, there's a long tradition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah, there's a long tradition. <laughs> Do you want to say more about this? So, so in, yeah? Uh, well, I mean, I think it's, it's what, okay. uh, I guess it, it's what uh, we are going to try to sort of like figure it out throughout the week. But I think there is a long tradition of that, of, um, it has been utilized as how to undermine uh, 
others in the way of decision making. Um, now there is a trend in which uh, I would argue um, there is a process in which people are being asked but not necessarily being taken into consideration, therefore taking their agency into the process. And there are other ways as well. Um, what I wanted to say with that is, uh, yes, I do think there is a long tradition. And I mean, the, the role of the architect historically has been, in a way, to uh, articulate various forces to make a project happen. Uh, articulate economic forces, political forces, social forces. Uh, and I would say there is a long tradition of that. Uh, yeah, I think I would disagree with that quite, yeah. quite uh, vividly. Quite, I uh, know. Um, in in terms of, um, I don't think architectural degrees actually um, uh, prepare for um, these kind of discourses that are to be had in wider publics. No? So the kind of um, language. Um, that is being used in, in schools of architecture and um, no, the, the kind of um, uh, vocabulary that is being established. I, I think, no, and of course we can say that of many, many different disciplines, but um, uh, there is, and this is maybe also my critique about, um, about the, this modularization of that interest within at least um, schools of architecture in the UK, that there is, um, it's very often down to an individual module to, to, to engage, but you don't really um, necessarily uh, learn negotiation techniques, I would say. No? So what, what is it actually? How do you, how do you create a, no? um, a, a certain discourse? No? How do you, if, if it's about um, sort of a, a non-hierarchical playing field, how do you actually engage? Whom do you pull in? Who should be sitting at the table? I don't think that any of that is, is, is properly articulated in terms of, um, of architectural education. At, at least I've not seen this in, in, uh, in any of the schools of architecture. Yeah? We very often, we don't even take um, gender into account um, very, very directly. It's, 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 it's shocking, I guess, um, still, you know, that, uh, that uh, uh, I don't know, the RBA, um, the Royal Institute of British Architects, um, there's 30% um, of, 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 uh, of women members, 10% of those have children. So we don't necessarily talk about no, what, what effects certain professions have. So there is no discussion, I would say, in architectural education about how to actually facilitate these discourses, how to, how to, um, how to bring about um, uh, these, um, these things in practice. Would maybe even add to that that I think architects are typically trained to be quite polemical. There's perhaps too much polemics and not enough kind of persuasion or sort of, yeah, kind of rhetorical capacity to engage different audiences. The architect typically kind of learns to be a sort of sender and using sort of media in order to kind of. Um, yeah, communicate sort of certain messages about, I don't know, you know, one's handwriting or a certain sort of design agenda and so on. Yeah. But um, to facilitate a kind of broader discussion, yeah. I think architects yeah. are not so well equipped, perhaps. So I would agree with you yeah. on that. So there's, there's been a recent drive also in, in at, at least again in the UK, and I've seen it elsewhere, to move to um, technology, no, or big screens actually, um, no, as a means to present uh, your projects, no? Big sort of touch screen swiping left and right and up and down and no? you lose sight completely of the process if you're not really trained uh, to see um, these kind of things, no? So we're not really um, uh, educating, or at least you know, it's, it's not concise in that sense. We're not educating for people to use the most appropriate means um, uh, no? available to them uh, to um, to um, talk about a project in in the context that um, that it should be happening in it's it's a standardization of mechanisms of means of techniques that um, that is sort of creeping into every single aspect of education so I think um, I'm, I'm actually quite shocked um, at the things no, that are happening in terms of no, we were at a, a quite a good point maybe ten years ago but it's sort of moving backwards in many regards. So it's, it's no longer about um, imaginative sort of presentation of your material, no, or knowing exactly who you who you are working with, who are you working um, not towards, but it's it's um, sort of just your, no, yeah. There's a big screen. We we're saving on printing. Great. No? 
Um, sensitivity um, that's instilled in architectural uh, practice and education to the kinds of value propositions that architecture generates for a community, for instance. Essentially, these, are, these go before planning boards and, and they become objects, ultimately, uh, that are supposed to satisfy a certain desire within a neighborhood or a community. But there needs to, I guess, also be a sort of an awareness of, of a very historically and materially situated practice that sort of um, is entangled with developing um, objects um, that relate to a certain level of desire, but that are also sort of recuperable within certain capitalist frameworks and, and, and so forth. Um, but I think that also probably takes opening it up to different modes of analysis, not simply retinal visual representations of good ideas or imaginary sort of situations that are presented to a public through the uh, glossiness of like concept on a screen, for instance, but like actually um, um, uh, understanding the levels of architectural engagement through the years historically that have set it within a specific form, an expert practice that reproduces commod commodity at will. It reproduces commodity uh, under the term of social engagement, it reproduces commodity um, in its own isolation as um, uh, expertise. Um, anyway, so that long rant was just about like sort of like in, in implicating this level of, of I don't know I don't know how to call it maybe a socially aware sensitivity but uh, more maybe I'm more on the lines of like how do you historically situate what this profession is within an actually substantive mode I don't know. I want to go a little further. You seem to be implying that the architect has a special responsibility for the quality of the experience that people will have in their buildings. And so it's the job of the architect to take into account as many different factors as possible. Gender, race, history, politics, economics, uh, religion, you can name, there are no limits to all the different factors that can play in the existential experience that people have within buildings. Now the question is, what is the part, now there's no doubt that the architect should be one of the players, but you seem to be assuming that they have special responsibilities that maybe others don't have, and I'm just wondering if you can clarify that. Special responsibilities. In, for the quality of the experience that someone's going to have in the building that have been designed. And um, the, the quality of the experience, what, what do you mean by that particularly? I mean, well, are we talking well, about... Well, that's part of the question, is how do you judge the quality of the experience and by what criteria and who does the judging? <laughs> um, I guess um, I've been really inspired by... Um, certain participatory projects from the 1960s whereby the architect um, um, designed certain frameworks that then can be filled in by um, people according to their personal uh, wishes, um, dreams, and desires. No? So I, I see um, the architect as, as, as really someone who provides frameworks no, that then can be filled in by, by others. Yes, but so I'm not, I'm not someone who would, uh, uh, no, this sort of big, the architect is that person who um, pushes certain decisions onto, onto people in terms of aesthetics. No, but you have so. to be aware of what are the different factors at play in order to yes. create that framework. Yes. So how much awareness is the architect supposed to have? This is my question. A lot. <laughs> I'd say a lot, yeah. But in practical terms, I mean, we, we've almost reached the point in a way where one could argue by analogy that too many doctors are concerned about disease and not about health. So we can take the argument similarly in architecture that too many people are concerned with spatial design and not really with the quality of the experience that goes in these buildings. So how do you, how do you judge these things? 
from a historian curator's perspective, you do need a lot of awareness when you're building, when you're designing things, and you're taking into consideration the target audience, right? Who you are creating for. Yeah, but a lot of things are, un, uh, are, are not necessarily that obvious. For example, for many years, since we lived in a patriarchal society, many gender issues involving women were ignored. So, so uh, who do you blame for that? You say the architecture. The architect in designing the building should have been aware of the special needs and responsibilities of women because they, they, they spent more responsibility in the house than the man does, and yet that hasn't happened. So who do you blame for that? Do we have to blame somebody? Well, we <laughs> seem to live in a society that does, yes, unfortunately. <laughs> Maybe that's one of the things that should change. Uh, sensitivity or awareness of like spatial design, I, I think um, it's, it's, it's fashionable to be more respondent to that sort of a thing to take care of um, what might otherwise be called like the phenomenological effects of, of, of the things that architects create. So um, I would say that the issue is, is, is okay, so in the sense how you, how you put it, um, are, are architects paying attention to the ways uh, space is, is designed for um, different individuals or communities? But in another sense, I would say that um, to the extent that attention is directed in that arena of this sort of phenomenological engagement, and there are many architects who have dedicated their practices to that, it becomes sort of a, uh, a social commodity with, um, with, with a value uh, uh, ascribed to it um, that puts it within a domain of access that reifies sort of these class structures that, that ostensibly we want to sort of work against. So I, I would just say that, um, just to add on to what you were saying, is this sort of under, underlying issue of what the architect actually creates in the, in the domain of objects, in the domain of experiences, and in the domain of commodity value. And maybe that's a good, a good moment to sort of draw things to a close. Um, I, I just wanted to point out that I think it's very interesting tonight. We've been kind of there's been an interesting slippage between discussions of the architect as the sort of subject of the conversation, and the uh, with whom I imagine many people here as associate themselves and 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 relate to, and with the role of the historian or the educator or the academic, um, with whom I imagine more people in this room actually associate themselves with, and the associated sort of sense of responsibility, um, and perhaps therefore, and the week is designed to be kind of additive. So I hope uh, you will come back tomorrow for the discussion with Palantan about architectural education, um, which will, I think, uh, develop some of these ideas further. Thank you very much, Tatiana, and also everyone who asked a question. <laughs>